Bye. Short bus debate club. It's a bus rolling. I can get on board. <laughs> Hello, I'm Darren Jolly. <laughs> it's time to get this short bus started. So let's roll and on with the show. Hello and welcome to the show. This is Brian Courtney, Short Bus Debate Club. As always, Darren Jolly's across the table from me. Hello. And uh, this episode number 37 is kind of a continuation of 36. So last episode we talked about (laughs) Joe Biden and his (laughs) leadership. Um, That's in big fat fucking scare quotes, all right? (laughs) Leadership. (laughs) This episode, we are going to talk about the burden of command um, in a more entertaining situation, I guess. We're going to tie it to, you know, TV and, and movies and entertainment. But the real reason that I wanted to do this episode is because regardless of what movie we talk about or what TV show, you know, whether it's Mad Max or The Walking Dead or Battlestar Galactica or fuck any of them. Um, the, the thing is, is that they're, you know, trying to accomplish this whatever and survive. So they've got to get to the next checkpoint or they've got to get, food or water or whatever. And then there's always these people on the periphery and they've got to decide whether they're hostile or friendly, whether they can be trusted or not. So the reason I wanted to do it is because I wanted to kind of see if you could have the burden of command and still be somewhat human um, without, you know, turning everybody away. Cause I, I fully understand it. I mean, when I think about going and hiding in the mountains, uh, there's a few key people that are there and anybody else, you know, I'm not bringing them into camp because then essentially I got to kill them cause they, they're going to give away my position. Right. That could be the case. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> I mean, that, that's why when we look at it through the, the lens of, of film or TV shows or what, and whatnot, it, I mean, it, it is so interesting. I mean, a lot of what we talked about in the, the last episode, or a lot of what was implied is that there's sort of like the emergence of this almost, it's not like in the form of a, like a concrete, clear despotism, but there's sort of an absolute power that makes sort of like an anti uh, position of power. Uh, even like tenable, you know, like what, what happened in the 1960s with, with the rise of people like uh, Huey Newton and, and, and Bobby Seals and Mark Clark and all the various different individuals that became leaders during that time period. You can almost not even imagine that in this day and age, which is why I think the concept of like post-apocalyptic fantasy has been one of those things that really fascinates people where you have something like the walking dead, where you can sit there and say, Oh, there is no longer a, a system that's giving us uh a way of thinking about how to go through the trappings of our daily day, day-to-day existence. So what would that look like? And again, like, like Brian suggests, like uh, part of the dialogue of walking dead from day one is when you start to interact with other people uh, in, in the bar scene, when he shoots the guys from Philadelphia, um, it's that's in like season three or something like that. Yeah. Um, in, in that scene, uh, after they kill them, their friends are outside and they're the, the people are yelling in and he's like, Rick's like, we've all had to do horrible things to get to where we are right now. Right. So like, that's like this, this question, like, do, can you be a part of my community? Can you not be a part of my community? And at most instances, people are going to defer to no. But in that, that instance with the bar in Philadelphia, you could kind of tell that those guys weren't somebody you'd want to bring in. I, 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 mean, I mean, because the one guy was talking about, well, is there any fucking gash or whatever he said? I can't remember. Maybe it was tinge, something, you know, cake, cookie, something. <laughs> <laughs> he was wanting to get laid. Yes, right. I remember. Yeah. Um, and they were swinging their guns around, like, you know, just trying to intimidate the guys. Yeah. Um, so I, I understand what you're saying. Um, but. 
I didn't think they wanted to be friends with the guys in Philadelphia. I just meant that that's one of those moments where the, the they two, those two things come together where well, you and can't I, trust people. I think that it's it's not just. I mean, because I I wanted to talk about the the Walking Dead, you know, from a utilitarian greater good sort of aspect, but. Mark Wahlberg was in a movie where they were in Afghanistan, a bunch of dudes. And I think one of them is uh, Highway 85 down there by the one that, Danny Valdez it's, it's or whatever. Guy, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that movie, a bunch of sheep herders came in to where they were hiding. They were getting ready to, you know, put their sniper rifles up and whatever. And several other guys wanted to kill him, but you know, the leader said, no, we're not going to kill him. We're going to tie him up. So they tied him up and then somehow they got untied. Kid starts bolting down the hill to, you know, say hey, there's fucking guys up here. Uh -huh. um, so they had to kill him anyway. Yeah. So I think it happens in the real world too. And I don't want to say that, you know, in a military scenario, it's going to happen because I've never been in the military my attitude does not bode well for a military <laughs> sort of function at all. Um, I'm not sure my attitude bodes well for any situation. Um, Where somebody is standing over you telling you what to do, that's for sure. That's, yeah, that, that is true. Um, but, you Wait, know. Go back to the utilitarian thing. What, what the fuck is that about? Well, so I think... If we go back to the, the Walking Dead, I think that Rick Grimes thought that everything he was doing was for the greater good. But in all actuality, it was only for the greater good of, first of all, in the first two episodes, it was for the greater good of his wife and Carl. Mm -hmm. And then he kind of pulled Daryl in and, you know, some of these other people. And then it was for, so the... The group continued to grow, but it was always for the greater good of that key group. It wasn't truly for the greater good. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, well, but but I, I don't think that that's something that should be looked at in absolute terms. I, I'd, I'd rather look at it as something that's in conflict. Where in conflict. Well, that's why I thought we needed to talk about yeah. it. Because, like, for instance, when they go and uh, – kill all the people up at the saddle, kill all the people. Ne like they don't even know who Negan is yet at that point in time. Right. They, they go and they kill all those people in the satellite and they kill them. They kill a bunch of people here. They kill a bunch of people there. They kill a bunch of people there. And they have no fucking idea how big of a force that they really run into right. in the moment that, that that's happened. Yeah. Cause Daryl and Abraham blew him up with a rocket. <laughs> <laughs> but that was just because those guys were dicks too. So obviously they were hostile. But they remember they find out all that stuff. Who, how, how did they end up? Was it because they met the colonel or something like that? Was it at the hilltop? Is that how they ended up? Because the hilltop had the relationship with the. Uh, um, okay, and and you are being it, it is utilitarian for that group because once they find the hilltop people, they say we'll help you get rid of Negan, but you're going to give us half your shit. Right. So, and that's what I'm saying is that I think the. And I don't want to boil it down to that stupid fucking argument that everybody always makes, you know, if, well, maybe not everybody, but this is what I learned in, in the philosophy class or the example that the, the professor gave was, you know, you have, I think it was from the East Coast because he was talking about a train bridge over a river and it was mechanical. Train's coming, but the drawbridge is up, Right your kid gets caught in the gears and the works of the drawbridge while it's up trains on the way. So you've got to make the decision at that point. Do you lower the drawbridge and kill your kid. or leave it up and kill the fucking, and more than likely, I mean, in that the example, the kid's going to die anyway, yeah. <laughs> unless he's maybe on the other side of the river. I don't know. Um, but I think, again, I think that Rick Grimes was always doing that. He was looking at his kids and his people. Um, later on when they were running through the woods, he told 
people in his group. He said, look, most of these people are not going to survive. Mm-hmm. Try to help them survive, but you survive. Do whatever you can and you get out. Right. If, if they lag behind, you leave them behind. But, you know, But still, in a certain way, he was always open to the fact or the thought of expanding it in a much different way. Like when Negan brings people in, like he, you, you are effectively part of his production process and you're going to, you, right. you have to work off everything that you get. And it's this crazy fucking hierarchical indentured servitude, you know, in some brutal motherfucking ways, you get ironed on the side of your face and shit like that. Well, and his leadership, I don't think is any better. Right. It's interesting though, because he, he makes it to where people follow him because of fear. Yeah. But to where they're scheming behind his back, like all of those girls ask, uh, whatever the fat guy's name is, the yeah, yeah. smart one. They yeah. ask him to come up with some way to kill or, him. Or all business up front, party in the back. Right. <laughs> um, you know, Daryl or not Daryl, uh, D. They called him D, but Dwight, maybe. Anyway. Yeah, well, yes, Dwight. Yeah, the one that was underneath. And he, he, he fucking ironed his face. Right. Because so he, then he took his fucking wife from him, too. Right. Like so he was daughter. he was scheming. That Simon guy was scheming. Everybody really wanted to kill him and take him out of power. And you could think, that okay, so if they assassinated Negan... That wouldn't have done anything because just another dipshit would have slid in and started running the group in the same fashion, more yeah. than likely, because that's the way that they were all groomed. Um, but I loved the psyop shit that he pulled. I mean, he had all those guys just fucking scared shitless. What of he them. did to Daryl when Daryl was captured with that song, dude. Dude, that song st- <laughs> sticks in my head, and I I don't even know the words. Something about going. We're in the. It's a, it's a happy kind of stupid song. Oh, it's a fucking horrible, horrible thing. I never heard the song before that show. No, me either. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say, and I will never listen to it again <laughs> after this show. But I, I just, in, in the comparison though between Negan and, and and Rick, yes, he, but he had constructed an extended family inside of that space. Herschel, but he'd have done anything for fucking Herschel and his and his daughters at that point. You know? Right. I, I'm not saying that he doesn't eventually let people in. What I'm saying is. Is that when he, because he, when he went to Herschel's farm, it was, he was separate from them. Yeah. No, he, he was not a lot. Yeah. It took, t- it took time. But I, like, I, I, and I, I'm not going to over romanticize Rick because Negan was, when he, when he engaged Negan, that demonstrated his doubt, downfall. He didn't really understand all of these other circles of, of humans that had evolved in this, created their own social spaces in this time period. But, Rick's way of constructing a community, I think, is something that's like you said. Negan creates these spaces where everybody wants to fucking kill him. If I don't think anybody wanted to kill Rick, that I did. Rick. I fucking hated him we, the entire until season nine when he you disappears. Not, uh, okay, you were not a character. The community in the community that he created was there anybody that wanted to kill Rick? Not that they showed, no. Okay. So, I mean, I, I was, that's... I, that's oh, no, no, no. That's not there. true. Um, the governor... Not the... The congressman's son wanted to kill yeah, him. Yeah, and fucking... And, and he emptied his belly because he's a chicken shit. Right. They played that game of pool and then... Bleep, um, his fucking guts. Nasty scene. Woo! His best friend wanted to kill him. Yeah, that's because he wanted his wife and his, you know. I'm not saying that, but I, I, I think that generally speaking, the community- but his his best friend did want to kill him because he thought that his leadership was incorrect. He thought that he should just take over Herschel's farm and kill everybody in the barn because Herschel was keeping he was all more those. Of a Negan, he was more of a Neganist, kind of a Neganist. Absolutely, he <laughs> wanted to to rule by fear. But I, you and I have kind of talked about this a little bit on different episodes and definitely offline. Mm-hmm. Fear is a way to rule. They, the royal they, rule by fear now. Um, how, how else do you rule? Can you rule by hope? 
you know, I, I don't think you can. It isn't just fear, though. There is affection. It's not pure fear. Part of the reason why the fucking the silly hillbillies from January 6th did not fucking take everything over is because they still have, even though they say the election was stolen, fuck that motherfucker, they still have an emotional connection to the, it wasn't just practicality, they didn't just stop doing it because they're like, this is not the right moment in time for us to try to take over the world. Right. It's because they do have an affection for the existence of the United States. It is. It's because they do have a certain reverence. To so there's a there's a respect there that's built in. I mean, love, like straight up, like they love or they have an affection. It's not the same thing as like with uh, uh, Machiavelli, but and, and you know, you know, Tupac read that book more than once. <laughs> I love you, Tupac. I don't mean to slam on you, but you shouldn't have put that whoever wrote here. that fucking that shit on the liner book, notes yeah. was stupid. But the. Uh, um, I mean, it's fear, love, and then the combination of the two, you know, and love as it, as it, as it goes with the United States, people that are born here, people that are grow up here, that the way that they attach themselves to the, the constitution, all that shit, that is affection. That is love, you know? So even those crazy Jack January 6th hillbillies, it wasn't just fear. Dude, there's no doubt. I mean, I, I do have that, that same problem. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I mean, as much as I, as much as we, we both know this is a fantasy. We both know that nobody's the both Bill of Rights and fucking all that shit. It's all just a bunch of trite, you know. The Bill of Rights went out the window a long, long fucking time ago. Well, you know, it was only created as a way of trying to pacify the different when they were trying to ratify the uh, the Constitution and the, they they needed to. We'll do this one for speech because Connecticut's bitching about that, and we'll do this one for. You know, no quarter in soldiers because, you know, Rhode Island's bitching about that, you know. I think they did the no quarter thing because they got fucking tired of fucking British soldiers just taking over their house, I, dude. I, I'm, I'm, what, I'm, 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 what I'm talking about is... I know. Is, they, they were trying to satiate the, the masses. Yes, exactly. Yes. yes, I gotcha. But the no quarter one was important. <laughs> Number one, buddy. So... Um... We don't. We don't need to debate the Bill of Rights, yeah. at least not right now. No, because there were some fucking important ones in there. Um, but we do both have an affection for the idea that's behind that. Yeah, no doubt, absolutely. And just the the Declaration of Independence and the things that are said in there. I mean, they truly wrote a fucking magnificent document, and that's the reason that I romanticize the voting so much is because. In theory, we're supposed to be able to take the power back at any fucking time we want. And if we can't, because we're under a tyrannical government, that's why we have the right to bear arms. Doesn't have jack shit to do with hunting, you fucking, fucking liberal cocksuckers. Get off your fucking why, soapbox. You know this stuff. Yeah, let's, let's talk, I, let's I don't talk know. About, I don't know that our four fucking listeners know. You know. Let's talk about Nathan Jessup, right? <laughs> you know, you know, Colonel Nathan Jessup. <laughs> I was thinking yeah. about him when I was driving home from work tonight, you know, and I was like, that guy is a real fucking cockbag. But there's everything that he said at the end when fucking Tom Cruise tricked him into talking, you know, and I really wonder whether or not like Aaron Sorkin, when he was writing this character, like understood how like you can hate Nathan Jessup, but everything he said was correct. He said, you may not you may not like me, but you want me on that wall. You need me on that wall. I mean, the fact of the matter is. For things to continue to exist, you have to have some nasty motherfuckers doing some nasty things sometimes, dude. There's no doubt. I'm not opposed to nasty motherfuckers or nasty things. That wasn't why I, I wanted to just talk about, you know, how, how do you protect those that you care about, whether they're on your team or whether they're part of your family or whether they're in a fucking squad or a militia or whatever, right? In a fantasy land or in where we're at right now? Just in general. In general, yeah. How do you keep them protected and still do the humanitarian thing? I mean, you know, okay, so I don't personally, I don't think that Nathan Jessup being on that wall is fucking important at all. I don't think that Cuba could cruise the 90 miles to get us. I, I think that 
having people in Guantanamo Bay is fucking completely worthless. So fuck Nathan Jessup and fuck that wall. Um, so you really think that the privilege that we've maintained has nothing to do with the military might of the United States? Oh, no. I, <laughs> that isn't what I'm saying. I'm saying that using Cuba as, as an example. I'm not example. being an apologist for the U.S. military. I, I hate the motherfuckers as much as anything. But I, I do understand that the welfare state was a birth because of a lot of the military things that we've done. The Our, our military is the reason that we have a lot of things. Mm-hmm. Um I don't know that they maintain our freedom. No, I'm not no. worried about communists no. coming in here. Well, no, but that's what Nathan Jessup was alluding to. That's what, you know, during the commie scare in whenever, I mean, 70s, 80s. That's how you keep us under. I mean, you got to keep us 50s, a, you gotta keep 40s. Us, you got to keep our minds in a certain space, <laughs> right? Otherwise, we get too free, you know? Like Samuel Huntington wrote this huge fucking paper in the 1970s called uh, crisis and democracy, where he basically said you have too much democracy. Too many things came out of the sixties and created too much democracy. They don't want that. They want us to just sit there and vote and say, thank you for letting us vote and suck a dick. I would, well, I don't know. I, I sort of went on a tangent there. Um, because I think I was making a point, but now I forgot what the fuck it was. Um, Something about the military. No, I don't care about Nathan Jessup on the wall. Um, well, the only thing I was trying to figure out is if you have these people underneath you, above you, because you know you're gonna you're gonna have to be responsible for people on both sides, reports and non-reports, or people you report to, and people that report to you. How do you do the thing that is necessary? How, I mean, whether that be kill that person or let that person in. And, you know, food is scarce, so you don't bring them back to camp because you can't fucking feed them. Do you end up feeling like a fucking asshole for letting this guy or this family, or this girl, or whoever, just fucking walk the other direction? Well, of course you do. I mean, even in, like, the smallest sense, like, you made a comment last time, because of my relationship to this house, like, I bear certain responsibilities with regards to the burden of command, right? Yes. And we have had people live in the house that were not uh emotionally capable of living in a, in a you know and i still felt bad but i had to get the motherfucker out i had to kick his fucking ass out i even had to kick my dad out right but you didn't <laughs> kill either one of them yeah, but we don't, so but there's still i know I, I i know we're not we're not quite at the phase where we have to start systematically eliminating certain portions of the population <laughs> did i just say that <laughs> Personally, I think we are at the stage where we should systematically eliminate large portions of the population. That's good. That'll be that'll go over real well with the twenty four people that are listening to this in Virginia and Maryland. I don't think it's twenty four. Um, well, dude, let's be honest. The fucking herd needs to be called. Well, that's, it's, gonna, it's gonna it's gonna come one way or another. I just don't. I just don't think that I really want to be. I don't think that I really want to be the one. You know. And honestly. I think that is for the greater good. So now we're going to talk about calling the herd, having a Stalin winter. No, you know? no, 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 no. I was just making a statement because another I talked, to, just another one of those talked about the, the greater good before. So seriously, because I would like to be able to take care of different people. But then again, I need to make sure that those people can bring something to yeah. the table, right? This is like when we were talking earlier and I said, why you, you, you were talking about your compound and then you would change your idea with compound. I, why wouldn't you? Cause this, this goes back to your original idea of yeah. the compound, because if you're going to be in a community that is limited with regards to resources, somebody else has to bring resources into that community. Otherwise you're, you know, yeah, you're, and I, you're a drag. Yeah, you're you're bringing down the rest of everybody else because now they've got to work what ten percent harder to yeah, you're you know bring thing. your yeah. stuff up or whatever. And the more weak people you bring, 
you know, the worse it gets. Um, and I'm not saying I need a bunch of fucking people to move lumber and trees and shit. No, it's, but, it's just it's a community. Yeah. It's a community that contributes, and, and and that can be complicated. What a person would bring to a community, you know, you might not even know. It might be something that just sort of develops over. And you're like, oh, that, I never thought of that. That's pretty fucking cool. Well, and that was something that I thought about, you know, because and I think it was you and I that were talking about it, but it might have been. I don't know. A- anyway, I thought, you know, like. I don't think a lot of old people could be there because they really are. I mean, you know, they need prescription meds and they need diapers changed and whatever. But if they were physically able to be there and not necessarily physically able to labor, I think maybe some of the things those types of people could bring to the table is just knowledge. Um, historic events and they're like the uh the what's the the, the old person around the fire that spins the golden right. flax you know <laughs> the, the wise one like the the yeah. elder they're, they're the elders of the tribe <laughs> the elder um sorry elder, no i just i started thinking of that fucking um one of the mad maxes where those fucking crazy ass kids started telling stories about Captain Rogers and coming in on the plane and they had that stupid record that they would spin on a stick. I haven't even seen Mad Max. I've seen Road Warrior three or four times and of course I watched Beyond Thunderdome when I was, you know, like in my teenage years, but I don't I don't I don't know what you're referring to. Okay. Well, Sorry little buddy. I think that was the same fuck maybe it was Beyond Thunderdome. I only remember the fucking little guy on the fucking big retarded guy's back. <laughs> Master Blaster. Master Blaster. No one messes with Master Blaster. Until Tina Turner did mess with Master Blaster. By killing Blaster. And then making that little dwarf shovel shit. Um, so, I don't know. I mean... I, I, I know we're not going to be able to develop a fucking system on a 45 minute podcast, but do you think there is fucking hope? Okay. Because you and I, again, on several episodes throughout this, the course of this wonderful fucking show that we provide, get on the bus, get on the bus. <laughs> um, talked about how the way things are looking, there are going to be multiple militias or gangs that break out, There's right? There's definitely some things that could shake out in a nasty, collected way. And so at that point, now we really are looking at a situation where you have to fucking decide almost immediately whether they're friendly or hostile and what to do in either case. So can we develop some sort of fucking humanity grid that would say, you know, or a flow chart <laughs> that says, okay, if this happens, you do this. If this happens, you do this. Do we just go by our gut? What are the ethics that should be involved in a situation like that? You know, it's 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 a great question. I mean, I don't like the fucking humanity flow chart idea, but <laughs> <laughs> I am I, – I, I, I mean – I just, everybody in the left in the middle of January, they stood there with their dicks in their hands, you know? I mean, like, they, like, I don't understand, like, and I'm not telling anybody to go out and, you know, blah, 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 but that was really fucking freaky, you know? And, and, it, and it could happen in a different way, on a different level, at a different time, which means that you have to have your human flow chart. You have to have your idea of how you would, you know, decide who you can trust and who you can't trust and, and, and where your concentric circles allow you to uh, engage. You know, I'm, I'm pretty good at, at reading people, but I don't know if I would trust myself in all of those situations that could pop up. I'm way too nice, dude. I want to trust people. It's not that I'm too nice. I mean, uh, yeah. Well, okay. Why? What, what's your, for me, it is for sure. I want to trust people. 
I don't know. I, I, well, I would never say that I'm too nice. Don't get me wrong. I'm nice to certain people, and I'm a fucking full-on asshole to everybody else. Um, but I don't want if whatever if everything implodes. Yeah. I don't necessarily want to be an asshole to everyone else. And that, I mean, I think it's a, a, an important question and I don't know because the ethics that were instilled in me by my mom say that I should bring everybody in and that shit can't happen. No, yeah, not, not, not in that moment. Cause it's very, everything's you're, you're all off, all, all, all material all supplies are limited. All, my instincts say to almost be like Rick Grimes and just fucking shoot everybody that doesn't do something for me. And that ain't right. So you don't like Rick Grimes because you're like him? Then Is that what you're saying? No, I didn't like Rick Grimes because I thought he put his people in danger for something that he wanted. So you are like uh, Shane then? Maybe. Yeah, I would. I would bang his wife. I would have killed Rick Carl right here. off, dude. No, I would have killed Carl too, which really? would have been too bad because Carl turned out to be pretty yeah, good. I like Carl, dude. Yeah. When, when they killed him off, that was like I quit watching the show. Honestly, I haven't been able to go back and finish it now because Carl was like my favorite. No, I meant I would have killed him when he was eight, because he was a kid, dude. I hate kids. I really don't like them at all. So you'd have just killed an eight-year-old, <laughs> really? <laughs> If you'd have done that to him, I'd have had to fucking pop a cap in your face. Right. See, that's what I'm saying. But did he bring anything to the table? He really did. He was ready to go from Jump Street. He was like, Dad, I need to understand these things. We, I know. They showed him how to shoot. We don't survive. Yeah. But the, when he, he made that point from the time that he was eight, and of course it's because he was a little kid and he wanted to have a gun. You know, I mean, I don't think it was pure, but no matter what. If you if you're eight and this nightmare is existing in front of you where motherfucking people are eating motherfuckers, you want to have something to protect yourself. Right, because that other kid who was about eight, um, the hot girl I never remember her name, but she was she was behind the wall too in Alexandria. She's the one that cut Rick's hair. She had two kids. Oh yeah, yeah. She got one of them tried to kill kill Rick, and then the other one was just a little fucking whiner, and he ended up getting them all eaten. Yeah, 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 yeah. Beat him up all the time. Yeah, beat up the kids at least. Yeah. So maybe, yeah. I don't know. I don't really. Yeah, that that dumb kid was a whiner, dude. He he got himself eaten up. Yeah. He had no instincts. He got himself eaten, and And his his mom. mom. Holy fuck, he did. (laughs) That was a brutal scene. That, that's like one of those episodes when I go back and like rewatch it because I have rewatched that one a few times. Um, like I can't watch that particular part because because you know that kid's never gonna make it. He doesn't have any of the fucking no. instincts, and you know that the other kid's too jealous. You know, so I didn't know that he was gonna get a fucking sh- a, a solemn chop through his fucking gut. You know, from or the show. Pearl in the eye. Yeah. Okay, so I mean, because obviously early on. I mean, you might be able to tell that one tell that that one kid's a fucking whiner, and he has no skills. So, obviously, the humanitarian thing to do is not to kill him. So, do you pull him aside and start to train him at a young age? You know, this is uh, the, the the tough question that you're asking here. You do have to kind of because think about Carol at the beginning. And yeah, Carol, she's a badass. Dude, she is the most hardened motherfucker on that show at the right. end, dude. And she was uh, like a, just a brow beaten, you know, her husband was fucking, and she was getting still getting her ass kicked by him all the time. And then finally he got eaten up, you know. Thank goodness for that for her, because my god, she became the fucking But see, I didn't say I would kill Carol. No, why no? And it's 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 apples and oranges because she's way older. And I mean, she could produce. She did stuff. She did do stuff. She helped out. Even even as kind of a mouse, she helped the camp, yeah. right? She'd wash clothes, and yes, there were things that she would do. Um, yes, I would pull him aside. We, but and, and they would have to understand that this is going to be – we need to find out whether or not your kid's going to live or die. You know? Okay, so then that is kind of the thing that I was getting at is that I think it's important – 
Because that one, the hot girl that ended up getting eaten because of her weak kid told Rick that he couldn't eat or he couldn't train either boy yeah. because, and obviously there was the situation because he had killed their dad. <laughs> but, <laughs> He's mad because he said he killed his dad. There's just this emotional baggage <laughs> that he just can't quite get over. But if you're Rick, do you... I mean, do you lay down the law and you say, look, we have to train them. Someone has to fucking train them now because they're no good. One of them is a whiner and he's scared of his own shadow. And the other one wants to shoot, but can't. It's so tough because like they came in and like they kept putting them all into positions of power. Right. And the senator lady, she, uh. She's like, I'm giving you guys control of everything. This is not good. This is not good. There was a, That's the tough thing about time, you know, is, is that, you know, your little Alexandra can't be built in a day, you know. They just didn't have enough time to get them to where they needed to be at. But he was – he was. they already were sort of going through the process of trying to help them to – but the problem was they had been stuck behind – I mean, they're, they're still living in a fucking fantasy land. I'm surprised they weren't fucking watching, like, Leave it to Beaver on the fucking TV or something That like was that. Rick's argument most of the yeah. time. And he, that was the community that I was talking about where he was always talking. Well, I mean, he did it in pretty much every season, but it was always us and them. Mm -hmm. And it took a while for Alexandria to become us. Yeah. Um, actually, the fucking congresswoman had to die before most of them became yeah, really, us. She came, she came full circle to realize what needed to happen when she got bit. I mean, yeah. that was... But she did tell him right before. So she said, why did you save my son? And he said, because he's your son. And she said, that is the wrong answer. And it really is. Yeah, it was an interesting point. Yeah. Um, I mean, because there are a lot of other answers he could have given because he was a human because I needed him on watch. <laughs> yeah, because he contributed something. No, yeah. That's... She was an interesting one. And she wasn't around for very long. She no. Was, the doctor girl, she was awesome. I was sad that she took a fucking arrow in the eye so quick. Yeah. But, you know, Dwight wasn't even aiming for her. No. Yeah. Yeah. That crossbow kicks like a bitch. <laughs> um, okay, so no flow chart. <laughs> Obviously, I'm not going to take any of the ethics that have been instilled to me by the church. Um, except maybe, you know, I, I try to follow that, and they they never, you know, come right out and say it. The, the golden rule thing, you know, where you just treat people like you want to be treated. And I think that that might be a start, but I... There's got to be something else besides the treat people the way you want to be treated. You know, because obviously if I'm shooting somebody, I don't want to be shot. Um, if I'm giving somebody a loaf of bread, I wouldn't mind getting a loaf of bread. But if you're shooting an asshole because they're being an asshole, you could probably get shot yourself if you're being an asshole. You know? Okay, so... You don't just shoot people for no fucking reason in this world that you live in, although you are suggesting that you might actually do that, which means that you would not be abiding by the golden rule entirely all the time. No. That's why I'm trying to fucking figure out how to live if everything implodes. Dude, a, a, a written ethics, you know? I mean... No, just a fucking guideline. Come on. For, <laughs> for the four viewers or the four listeners, for me, help a brother out. <laughs> <laughs> Shit, pee -pee. that's all you have to say <laughs> um i don't know we're we're coming up on 40 minutes i i hope you four people are really enjoying the show and if you've got any ideas on on this ethical quandary that i'm having you know please let me know um am i <sighs> I don't think I'm incorrect in my thought process, but I also don't think that we've actually come to any 
real conclusion except that you're too nice and I'm a fucking asshole. Well, I mean, but the real question is when you're in the middle of those moments, you know. And I mean, it's so too, like it's it's also academic until like things get to the point where like you don't have people that are around you all the time. You have a, a, a group of people that you have, like whether it's seven of them or forty-two, you know, what, whatever point you are, like. We, we all know one thing, I think it's fair to say, and that that's societies work. They tend to work better when we're not at odds with other people. And the potential of a society gets greater if we're not at odds with other people constantly. So, so there, there was a girl uh-huh. that I know. Um, we just recently parted ways. Um, but I used to joke around with her about, because I only had a few guns. But I had shit tons of ammo. I was always like, you know, if if things go bad, we're okay. Because we don't have enough stuff right now or enough guns right now. But we've got enough bullets to where we can get more guns and more stuff. (laughs) That was kind of a joke. But not entirely. I mean... Sun Tzu said, take the guns of, well, he didn't say guns, but take the the armor and supplies of of your enemy. Um, It makes transportation a lot easier. I'm paraphrasing, by the way. You didn't say it just like that? (laughs) (laughs) Because he also said something about gold and silver, but um, mainly the the armaments. so I don't think I'm wrong in joking around like that because I think at some point it, it could come to something like that. You know, the the one group that I thought was fucking hilarious on the show was the Vatos. The guys that they cleaned the... They, they they clean the old folks' place. You oh know? yeah, yeah. But at yeah. first they they like made themselves look like gangbangers, you know. Right. And and totally came off like that. But they were like the nicest guys in the history of the fucking universe when they when they actually met met, met up with them, like. And that was the one ni- nice thing that Rick did right off the bat was help them get all those old people out of there and somewhere safe. Yeah, that's cool. You know? Yeah, that was good. I don't know. Again. If I would have done it because those old people were really on the fucking verge of dying anyway. So why expend all of that energy, all of that time, all of the bullets, which are now a finite resource to do that when, you know, in a week or two, those people are just going to be walking dead too. Well, hopefully they just give them a, they should get that cattle prod that they used in No Fear for. Maybe I'm looking no at it the wrong man. way, dude. I don't know. I Because now I, I just said that and I realized that I came off as kind of an asshole. But seriously, I mean, I'm just being a realist. Realist, who knows though? I mean, that's why, like when I talk about it, like when I what I was saying before was if you're going to survive, you're going to have to continue to reconnect with other communities. You're going to have to be able to open up your space and you don't want to fucking get, but you don't want to get land based, land based. so it takes, it takes a little bit of time in those moments. You can, you can tell me whatever you think you're going to do. And that could be the, exact yeah, we, we need to be in those circumstances to understand them. I don't, I don't ever want to have to feel like that, but I mean, there's enough weird shit going on and with the environment and all that stuff, these are things that could be very, you know, we, I, 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 you, you want to survive? I want to survive. You know, there's only one fucking cookie left. You know, one of us is dead. The other one gets the cookie. You know, we're not splitting cookies at this point in, in uh, the game. That's, I guess, a valid point. Um, well, fuck, I don't know. I really want that cookie. <laughs> It'd be cooler if it was just like Camelot, you know, but it's just not. <laughs> No. Um, I don't know. I mean, and obviously, you know, we did the episode on Monday and then, you know, this one, we tried to 
make it more entertaining and tie it to, to shit you guys probably care about. Um, if you watch The Walking Dead, then maybe. Or any bullshit apocalyptic type show. Um, but I, I really think something bad is coming down the pike. Um, I just don't know what it is. And I don't know if we are going to have to kill old people. I don't think it's a zombie apocalypse. So I don't agree. Unless you consider, people. unless you consider stupid people, zombies, and then we're already in the zombie apocalypse. Yeah, sorry, George Romero. All of a sudden. Yeah. Um, well, fuck it. I'm done. I have no last thoughts. That was all of my thoughts for this day. Darren? I I, I, I think you're really hard on Nathan Jessup. <laughs> you, you want me on that wall. <laughs> fuck you. Get off the wall. Well, sir, so I don't want to go too far down, but I mean, are you really worried about Cuba? <laughs> He's no, one dude in I one know, place. I know. <laughs> I'm not worried about again. And I'm I'm hyper. I fucking want them to get rid of the fucking military. I want them at least to draw it back. I want to. I thought that like I said in the last episode when they did the Minsk, Minsk Accords, they should have fucking brought Russia into the fold. If they were if we were doing joint military operations, we wouldn't be fucking sitting there talking about killing each other all over the place. I wouldn't be bringing up shit about fucking te- the nuclear the little nuclear bombs whatever what, what are the tactical tactical nuclear weapons you know i wouldn't be saying stupid shit like that i would if this didn't happen right now in relation to the military i wouldn't be thinking about a number of fucking things we'd be like holding hands singing motherfucking kumbaya and shit but no i don't ever remember doing that ever i just i just think it's important for people to understand that it's very easy to sit there and be critical of the military when we are living in a place where Super privileged because of what it is that the U.S. military has done, both in terms of production and in terms of execution. That's fair. Um, all right. Sorry about the dead air people. Um, I don't see any dead air people. Twitter, short bus debate. TikTok, short bus debate club. The phone number is 720-334-ROLL. And that's what we're going to do. We're rolling the fuck out of here. See you later. Bye.